Welcome back, everybody, to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. This show is brought to you by all the clothes of Vanilla Soft Company. Now you'll notice I'm I'm not sure I'm finding it. He's not here this week, but that's okay because we've got Jamie Shanks with us. And I'll confess, I at the very very beginning of my career, way back now, I was one of the social selling people, and uh, Jamie was pretty much the main guy at the time then. And uh, a lot of people in that sphere, you kind of like you had to know the certain figurehead people, and Jamie was obviously one of those. It was quite a small little market and, and it's it's a bit different now. So I'm sure we'll get into how he's doing what he's doing right now. But Jamie actually listens to the show. So at the end, I'm going to have to ask for his objective feedback. He can give me some some grief and tell me how we can do a better job. So anyways, Jamie, how you doing? Welcome to the show, man. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. So um, right off the bat, uh, when, I, when I left school, um, I joined a company. I was the social media manager. And basically from there, I fell into the world of social selling. It was like the thing. And um, really, I don't think it's much of a, a thing anymore. It's still like a practice as well, it's a thing that people do, but people don't talk about it as much as they did then. So how did you come to that point in, in your career where you said, you know, we're going to talk about this and it's going to be my thing from now on? Um, mine was just a failure of a consulting company that was going nowhere. So long of the short, 2010, I started a consulting company, jack of all trades, expert of nothing. For two years, it floats around and I'm helping local Toronto businesses with, at that time, there was this thing uh, where inside sales teams were just being built for the first time. Long of the short is I saw in the summer, end of 2011, summer of 2012, I saw the emergence of LinkedIn from a business development standpoint. And there's a whole longer story, but I would spend my nights reverse engineering how to use LinkedIn as if it were the telephone and email. And I self-discovered that I could create pipeline for myself. Then I would teach others in Toronto how to do that. They were way more interested in what I was teaching them than actually my core services. Light bulb went off. I called it social selling and built the first kind of global curriculum on the topic. I, I fell into enablement. And within a year, I was you know, training Oracle and Thomson Reuters and ADP, and it took off from there. So that I didn't intend to do it. It was a forced function of a lack of pipeline for myself. Right. So um, that led you into basically training and those types of things, a whole lot of content. And there was, I would say, five years within my career that maybe there was a bit before I started, but there was a good five years where social selling was the red, white, hot thing. And then for some reason or another, it kind of like drifted away a bit. It became more common knowledge. So it wasn't quite as like ferociously hot. And maybe the word social selling kind of sounded a bit strange. But but anyway, so so what did you do during that point? Where, where were you? What were you doing? And, it, it, uh, and I'm sure we'll get to where you are now. I think the reason that it started to drift apart is few companies could put it into a framework that fit for global enterprise, global mid-market companies for an outbound account-based sales development role. So social selling, people were doing bits bits and bobs of tips, tricks, and tactics. But a lot of it was teaching people to develop social profiles and share content. And that works as a good solid inbound strategy if you're a pre-seed, seed round, series A company that where, where inbound flow is the majority of your lead flow. Now I want you to picture that you're Microsoft uh, and all of a sudden the average seller is a complete outbound seller and everything needs to focus on a territory, a group of accounts. We reframed it and we took social selling. We just really thought of it as digital prospecting. And we kind of went into that route Knowing that social selling, A, the tactics would become free and commoditized on the internet. B, they don't work for every role in every situation because this is not inbound social media marketing. This is truly just prospecting in a modern digital way. And then COVID changed the game because it completely fast forwarded what if you thought of it as a bell curve of early adopters to kind of core function all the way down to laggards, COVID made us all become quote unquote social sellers overnight. And so now if you are not digital prospecting or social selling, well, you're just not in a modern economy. So, 
You know, it's yeah. it's funny that you say that because for until I joined Vanilla Soft about two years ago, I'd never made a cold call in my life. Um, I'd only ever sent emails, but my primary was always social media. I don't know why I just defaulted to it. Maybe it's like age and the time of my life that I started my career and just the prevalence of whatever was prevalent then. But I started off with, you know, we need new clients in the recruiting space. Well, they're on LinkedIn. I go there, right? It's just that obvious and that like first line obvious to me. But I know obviously for people who have, who have grown up cold calling, it's, it's a little bit different. But my first sales job was literally, as you said, um, an account-based super duper enterprise company on contract with it, with the company I was with. We had to get five appointments a week with LinkedIn and Twitter only. And we never missed quite a once. The problem was they didn't build that skill at all because we were outsourced. So much as we got the appointments, they might as well have just got any appointment from any channel and probably would have gotten more by doing a mix of channels rather than just social media as well. But they couldn't adopt it because it was done for them. We yeah. should have been like training or or working with them and workshopping and, and other things. But it did work. And then they had a problem with what to do with the leads because they, they didn't understand how we'd gotten them. So I, I totally resonate with all of that kind of thing. So, so take me forward a little bit. You, you've ridden that COVID world where everything's changed. And now you're doing something a little bit different. So what's going on? Yeah. So let me tell you the challenge with enabling... You know, we enabled a quarter million sellers, 600 global customers around the world. And it's amazing how Pareto's law uh, rears its its ugly horns. And what I mean by that is Gartner used to do a study on the percentage of sellers that were A players, B players, and C players. And as enablers, you always think that you could debunk that myth of Pareto's law. But in fact, it holds true. 20% of sellers drive 80% of impact. 20% of sellers will take new enabled skills and run with them. Another 50% will, again, do piecemeal parts of it. And then you'll have 30% that will do nothing with it. So long and the short, we're teaching sellers one of the most basic sales plays that we were teaching is called the sphere of influence, which means you take a happy customer of yours, put them in the center of a sheet of paper and draw a circle around it, then draw spider webs coming off of that logo. Let's say that logo was Yeti water coolers. Now, all of a sudden, you're looking for customers on the move, people that leave that account and go somewhere else. This was highly impactful as we're teaching it. But sellers would say, I can't do this at scale. I can't keep up with monitoring this information. As a global centralized business with thousands of customers and thousands of prospects, you know, People are jumping from one territory to the next, one vertical to the next. I can't possibly do this. Would you do this for us? So when COVID hit, we looked at the training business and said, what if we also created a complement, a do it for you business? So you are both enabled and we give you the answers to the test. So we created a software company called Pipeline Signals that monitors every customer on the move, everyone that gets hired everyone that gets promoted, everyone that leaves. And it correlates, most importantly, did they come from your customer base? These are called your fans or your advocates. We route that into any sales tool. Could be VanillaSoft, could be Salesforce, HubSpot, Groove, doesn't matter the tool. And the seller now has a campaign of sales intelligence amongst the other forms of sales intelligence they have to make the most important decision around prospecting, which is decision-making around account selection and account prioritization. We're giving them the you know these golden opportunities to talk to customers on the move, which helps select and prioritize accounts for them. Okay, I'm going to ask you a difficult question then. Um, my favorite skill in sales and something that I think I'm good at, everyone could always get better, but this is like where any good cold email becomes freaking great or it just stays good, for example. The, the ability to knit action to relation to something else is where things get interesting. So trigger events such as funding round or customer yeah. leaving and going somewhere else, as you just said. The ability to write something which knits that event towards um, the reason for connecting is yeah. paramount. And look, I remember in school when we when we were doing our exams, we would always have to 
we would coach like if you're going to get a, an average grade you're just going to reference the the quote in the book or something if you're going to get a brilliant grade what you're going to have to do is draw that line and it's the exact same thing I, for some reason that always sticks out in my mind how do you teach people to do that because the reps that i can that i've seen and watched that do it they have incrementally better reply rates they have uh, so much more ability to, to communicate things on their calls and obviously that creates more deals for them which is probably why they're in the 20 percent. but how, how do they get that how do they coach that so i will say something maybe a little controversial to how we stitch this together i believe the value of the message is not the stitching of the fact that you and i went to the same university or congratulations on your b round or congratulations on your new job you just came from our customer apple that while that is the opening line to the email the linkedin message the, the icebreaker we'll call it the substance of the message al actually sits in what's called the value exchange the value exchange means that ollie i want to book a meeting with you what you have to give me and the only thing you have to give me is time the thing that i have to give you in exchange is knowledge about something you don't already know. I need to push you off your status quo. So the main part of this message has to be that I need to, I'm trying to earn 30 minutes of time from you. And in doing so, I need to give you something you don't already know. And so you need to give insights that could be wrapped in a video, that could be wrapped in a PDF or a landing page, that could be a study, that could be competitive intelligence. That could be, for us, we give free signals. So I would give somebody, by the way, here are two of your customers that are on the move. Did your sellers already call these people? So I'm now painting the opportunity cost of missing this. But if you are not giving something in the law of reciprocity, asking for time back, you go nowhere. So that's my take is that what you described is the knitting of the connection point is important because it justifies the opening statement of your message. But that's not the real meat and potatoes that drives the actual meeting booked. I agree, but I also think it's a little bit in how you say it. So for example, if I was to go, it's like hey, Jamie, like, congrats just, on your new job, right? And then I'm going to send you my pipeline signals across. But if if I say, I'll do two examples, the, the bad one being, hey, Jamie, congrats on your new job. I sent you some pipeline signals. Pretty crappy way of saying it. <laughs> or if I go, hey, Jamie, congrats on your new job. Um, you probably want to start off with a bang. Like, uh, you know, you're a senior person in the company. I'm saying it in a long way, but you want to start off with a bang. Um, here's a quick win for you. Low hanging fruit. Here's six customers that you have, which are looking at other companies or, or are leaving that type of thing. You've, in a way, you frame that in such a way that I can now buy into it. Because, for example, if a, if a good friend of mine leaves a company and they start a new one, if I email them and I say congrats on the new on the new job, whatever it is, they might meet with me like on relationship basis. But if I don't know them, they don't. That's it. So they'll, in, particularly in big companies as well, if you're doing this for customers, you're going to have lots of customers, and the likelihood is lesser that you know them very well. So you've got to have much more like trimming on it, and the and address that well. The trimming that I use, so I use a four part message framework. I gave you the top piece. The icebreaker statement is the connectivity between you and them, whether that's at a personal level, at a, at a last customer level, at a, I've done a little bit of homework, you've just raised capital level. The second piece to that, before we get into the value exchange, is the value creation. I believe there's only three ways to drive value for anyone or any company. I either make you money, I save you money, and or I mitigate risk, risk of failure, lawsuit, closing down your business, whatever it is. So I quickly would want to correlate the you know, congratulations on your B rounds, um, what I'm about to give you or show you. And I know that I'm not phrasing this very well, but is these are opportunities that will open doors three to five times faster or make you more money. I've got to get to the aha moment of value creation for them. And I, I think it's always better to focus on the person. Like, what do you think that role, value creation for that role is? Because people are self-serving. That's where I would kind of take it. So that's that's where I would flow from uh, the icebreaker to the value creation, value exchange, and then the call to action. I like it. Okay. 
So I wanted to ask you, I've seen um, lots of different like versions of this in, in various degrees of success. I think it, like, like we were saying, a large degree of your success comes down to how you apply it. What are bad, uh, what are bad emails or bad outreach, how outreaches have in common when they're doing this type of thing? Do they, um, do they just throw up the, the event and hope for the meeting or, or what other kinds of things that the reps do where they're trying to use it well, but they're not actually doing it? Two things that get me, and I realize that every person is different, every buyer is different. And that's why coaching to one style, like there's frameworks, but then they're saying this is the the you know the greatest message ever. For me, what I tend to delete quick, lack of brevity. So people who are if it because you remember, most of the time I'm viewing this off of a mobile device. So if it can't fit and if you really have to think of the framework of an iPhone, if it can't fit within top of the fold of the iPhone, I'm going to pass by it uh, and delete it. Number two is I'm a sucker for extreme person, uh, personalization. When I think of the things that I've bought for sales for life or pipeline signals, many times they're accompanied in a video format. Now, again, that doesn't mean that your buyer, the chief information officer or chief financial officer is going to be akin to loving video, but it is for me because I'm a visual person. I watch YouTube. And, and so video for me shows me that you actually really do believe that you can add value to my business. And I should pause for a moment to learn. I'm a visual person too. Yeah, video always works for me. Yeah. All right, Jamie, I'm switching gears a little bit. Maybe one or two more questions and we'll, then we'll wrap up. What mistakes have you made so far with this company? I'm, I'm sure there's plenty. Oh. Every company's got loads of them, but what, what are some of the worst? Pertinent to what we're talking about. Let me, you know, because the zero to five million podcasts. So, uh, you know, makes complete sense what we're talking about. Sales for life grew from zero to $3 million in a couple of years. Pipeline signals now zero to a million dollars in a year. I'll tell you where I thought I wasn't repeating a mistake and I did in reverse. Let me explain. In Sales for Life, we built a content marketing engine first and only. No outbound. The zero to $3 million, but never really had the financial acumen to understand CAC to LTV ratios. I woke up five years in and my marketing spend was $800,000 on a $3 million business. Okay, so my cost to acquisition and my my payback period got so out of whack. And I regretted not building an outbound function as well. So we start pipeline signals and we built it in reverse. We built the outbound function first, got to SQL a day, fantastic. But now a year in regret that we didn't, because we said to ourselves, we're we're so good at building inbound machines and content machines. We'll get to that later. But forgetting that it's basically like planting a tree. When's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago, second best time is today. What I would have for inbound flow one year later, as in this moment in time, would be fantastic start. And I regret not building that inbound flow one year ago when we started. It's funny how you did it. The complete opposite. So it probably did didn't look the same, but it was. To force us to build an outbound muscle, what that did is neglect inbound traffic. Yeah. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to do my last question that, uh, that I said at the start, and then we'll do the the last final question. You're a listener. You listen to this podcast. What, what can we do better? What, what do you like? What do you dislike? And uh, I promise not to cry. Sean, I don't promise, but... No, no I think that uh, I, I think what you guys do is you serve a part of the market that is rarely discussed. If you listen to Saster and all these sort of, they're always talking about scaling the hundred million dollar business, the billion dollar business. But so many of us are still trying to get to five million, trying to get to ten million ARR. I think that's what you're doing. Fantastic. Uh, I would bring on more guests. I would bring on. Uh, more opinions into the cycle of the show. There we go. Glad I asked. Thank you very much. All right, Jamie. So, um, so last two. Um, I know that you listen to the podcast. So that's one thing. But how do you self-educate? Like, what what do you kind of do? You're a visual person, so maybe a bit of YouTube. That's what I do. 
Books, so, courses, other stuff? I'm a visual person, but I retain through audio. So I listen to, I have five to seven podcasts in rotation. I listen to at least one to two podcast episodes every morning. Uh, back up. I get up at 5 a.m. every day. And I really start consuming content through audio from about 5, 10. I have a shower speaker for the next couple hours. I listen to a couple podcast episodes. I go on a five kilometer walk and I chip away at a book a week. So ironically, the way that I retain knowledge, I never buy physical books, even though I wrote two. I only listen through audio because it's the only way I can remember. Me too. I find like every now and then one book, I can do it, but I can't do it consistently. I have to like pick a medium for me, but but that's just me. And, and last one, Jamie. So where can people find out more about you and what you're doing with Pipeline Signals? Uh, simple. Go to PipelineSignals.com. We're here to get you more at-bats. Like it's a, this is a prospecting tool that also enables your sellers how to turn leads into sales qualified leads. And connect with me on LinkedIn as well. I think I'm the only Jamie Shanks that looks like this guy or uh or has in the footnotes and uh, jamie shanks you can put that in but how many connect with you on linkedin all right well thanks dude thanks very much for coming on much appreciated and um with that it's the end of the show so make sure you like and subscribe whatever you're watching we're on pretty much every platform that there is for podcasting and we even linkedin live sometimes too so if you don't mind like and subscribe leave a comment if you enjoyed the show and we'll see you on the next one folks thanks thanks for the invite